CBD FX's CBD products are formulated to boost overall wellness and deliver calm vibes for daytime and nighttime use. CBD FX uses only organically grown hemp and all natural ingredients. CBD FX's best selling line of CBD products features wellness boosting CBD and legal Delta 9 THC gummies, oil tinctures, capsules, pens, and other products. Visit CBDFX.com today and use code Genius to get 25% off site wide plus a free CBD bath bomb with your first purchase. The code is GENIUS, G-E-N-I-U-S. Don't miss this special 25% off offer for Finding Genius listeners, only at cbdfx.com. Offer expires August 31st, 2023. Feel the difference with CBDFX. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have a returning guest from long ago. His name is Robbie Barbaro. We're going to talk about his uh, health journey and how he's discovered some really amazing things about diet that's helped him uh, keep his health at a very high level, even though he deals with being a type 1 diabetic, which is not an easy thing, I'm sure, for many people. Uh, he's got a lot of insight. The uh, last time we spoke again was uh, several years ago, and so I wanted to have him back. So, Robbie, thank you for coming back. Hey, it's great to be back, Richard. I'm really excited to continue the conversation we had in the past and share a lot of updates and just really help everybody understand the power of eating more fruit. I personally, I love fruit. I have used fruit to fuel my recent Ironman race and I'm training for my next one. I just, I think people have a lot of misunderstandings about fruit, and it's a real option of mine to share what people can learn here. Yeah, you know, tell me, it's been so long, if you can, just tell me about your background, go over that again, and how you got to this point, and then we'll go forward with uh, your eating plan and everything. Absolutely. So the fascinating part about my fascination with fruit is the fact that I'm living with type 1 diabetes, and most people think that, hey, if you're living with any type of diabetes, you really, you should limit your fruit intake. It's too high in carbohydrates. It's too high in sugar. And I've had the opposite experience. And we've had the opposite experience in our coaching program that Cyrus and I do together at Mastering Diabetes. And for me, it really, it all started when I was 12 years old. I was 12 years old. I was going to the bathroom all the time. I was thirsty all the time. I said, mom, I think I have diabetes just like Steve. So my older brother, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes nine years prior to me. So I was very familiar with the condition. And so for anybody who doesn't know the difference, type 1 diabetes, that is a autoimmune condition. So it's different than type 2. The main There's two different types. The main difference is that type 1's beta cells in our pancreas has been damaged. We're not producing enough insulin, whereas type 2's are actually producing excess insulin because it's a lifestyle condition caused by insulin resistance. We don't know the cause of type 1 diabetes. So I'm 12 years old. I essentially self-diagnosed myself with type 1 diabetes. My mom doesn't really believe me for a few weeks. Eventually, she's out of town, calls to check in and says, hey, you know, 
how are things going at home? I said, Mom, I couldn't sleep last night. She said, oh, well, why don't you go upstairs and test on your brother's blood glucose meter? So I tested, and my blood sugar was well over 400. That over four times higher than it should be. And as somebody who's a non-diabetic, it should never really go above, you know, 140-ish, 150. So as a young, healthy kid, that was a problem right then and there. And my brother said, yep, you have type 1 diabetes. Pack your bag. You're going to be in the hospital for a few nights. And so that was it. My parents came back the next night. I remember my dad just saying, hey, look, this is an inconvenience. You can still do whatever you want with your life. And I proceeded to follow the standard American diet because that was, the, that was what I was told to do. I was patient at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. They had me at that time following the food pyramid. There was no special dietary advice. There was nothing about here's what you can do to reverse insulin resistance. Here's what you can do to prevent complications. It was really more about making me feel normal as a teenager and just following, you know, standard American diet. You know, have a serving of fruit with your dinner meals, you know, follow the food pyramid. And what's funny is when I had fruit as a kid, I either had mandarin oranges that came from a can, or if I had strawberries, I'd put powdered sugar on top. That's how out of whack my taste. I needed to add like, add sugar to fruit. It's crazy. So anyways, I continue along that path and I ended up developing some standard American diet symptoms. And eventually I tried many different things. But the last thing I tried before I landed on what I've been doing now since 2006, it was I was doing a ketogenic diet. It was a plant-based ketogenic diet. It wasn't called that back then because that term wasn't really popularized, but I was eating no more than 30 grams of total carbohydrate per day. I was getting my calories from nuts and seeds and oil. I had to be very careful not to have too many vegetables, like bell peppers would be too high in carbohydrate. Carrots could be too high. I was really sticking to this low-carb diet. And what I experienced was profound. So as a person living with type 1 diabetes, we are the most fascinating test subject for what lifestyle choices make insulin work more efficiently or less efficient. And for anybody listening who doesn't fully understand the function of insulin, let me give you a quick summary. Insulin's primary function is to take glucose out of your bloodstream into your cells. That's the primary function, okay? It takes glucose, specifically glucose, all right? out of your bloodstream, into your cells so you can have energy and live your life. When I was doing a plant-based ketogenic diet, I would need one unit of insulin for every one gram of glucose consumed. I can do this calculation with modern-day software where you can remove the fiber content. You can remove fruit. Is that a typical, quick question, is that a typical ratio for, for people that are type 1 diabetic and need one unit for one gram of Sugar. So in this case, for people following a ketogenic diet, the answer is yes. Although in the community, we usually talk about total carbohydrate, you know, which includes fiber, which includes fructose. But for this specific example of what happened to my health, I make a point to call out the fact that I am only calculating glucose to show that it is a true, in my end of one experiment, it is a true calculation of glucose to insulin, right? And so when I switched to a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, I'm now eating well over 700 grams of carbohydrate per day, okay? So before I was eating no more than 30, now I'm eating over 700 on a daily basis, okay? And my ratio of how much insulin needs to be injected for the grams of glucose I'm consuming jumped to 10 to 1. So that's a 900% change. 1 to 1 to 10 to 1 is a 900% change in insulin sensitivity. And the reason this is important and that why this impacted my life in such a big way and, and got me so passionate about this topic and, and creating Mastering Diabetes with Cyrus and writing the book was because I now had this personal insight into the solution for pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes, which is over 90%, all types of diabetes. And we have over 100 million people who are impacted by either pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes in the U.S. alone. So I was like, wow, like I know exactly what makes insulin work more efficiently by adopting these lifestyle changes. And I got to do something about this. So that's where this all started. That's how I got into it. And I'm really passionate about it, Richard. All right. So you started on the standard American diet. And how, how difficult was it? What did you notice about your symptoms and your ability to control your sugar and everything? Was it really difficult? Was it all over the place? And then as you started changing diets, what did you notice? So 
I have always been a type A personality. I've always been on top of my diabetes. You have to have some level of discipline in order to have you know a great A1C and, and keep your blood glucose under control. And I did that essentially on a standard American diet. I think I had a couple A1Cs in the high sevens. When you're type one, you really want to keep it below 6.5, somewhere between 5.5 and 6.5 is a good target. And I, in general, I was in check. But the problem for me was I developed plantar fasciitis in my feet, which was very frustrating. As a competitive tennis player, I had this pain. Plantar fasciitis is a very painful condition. It affects arches of your feet. CBD affects full spectrum and broad spectrum CBD products are formulated to boost overall wellness and deliver calm vibes for daytime and nighttime use. CBDFX is offering our listeners an exclusive 25% off, which I think is very generous, plus a free CBD bath bomb with your first purchase when you use the code GENIUS. Don't miss this special 25% off offer for Finding Genius listeners only at CBDFX.com. Offer expires August 31st, 2023. Feel the difference with CBDFX. Uh, it took me four years ago. Possible to walk. Absolutely. It's terrible. So that was frustrating. And it was amazing. That improved when I changed my diet. And through physical therapy and a dietary change, which reduced the inflammation in my body all throughout my body, plantar fasciitis has been a thing of the past. I have not had to struggle with that. So that's amazing. I've been doing all this Ironman training, and it just it has not been an issue. So that's been great. The other conditions I had were chronic allergies. So I would get sick every single year. I would take my Nasonex. I would take my Claritin-D. I would still get sick. And people, for me, the allergies just went away. I stopped taking those medications I don't have allergies in any way, shape, or form. I'm not, I used to be like allergic to mold. I was allergic to if I was around Christmas trees. It was just a problem. But it's gone now. And we've seen this over and over and over again. When people change their diet, allergies disappear, which is amazing. I also had terrible acne. So I had acne so bad that I had to use Accutane, which is one of the most serious drugs you can possibly use for acne. Your parents actually have to sign a waiver because many people have committed suicide on that drug. And so this was all happening as a teenager, and it certainly hurts your self-confidence when you, your face is full of pimples, and it just, it's just not a good situation. And my skin dramatically cleared up from changing my diet and eating a low-fat plant-based whole food diet. So that was huge. And my insulin sensitivity, again, that's the big one, because that is what allows me to have predictable blood glucose numbers, which is very important for people living with type 1. If you're on the roller coaster, up and down, up and down, hard to know what's going to come next, and it's very frustrating. So predictable blood glucose has been great. And also just the the confidence to know that I am reducing my risk of any long-term complications. The number one cause of death, all types of diabetes, is heart disease. Heart disease is what ends the lives of people with diabetes. It's also the largest killer just in the Western world. And so it's great to have that as really a non-issue, a non-concern for me. My blood work has been fantastic. I feel fantastic. And I would say, lastly, the biggest change from the standard American diet to the, really the mastering diabetes method, that's what we're talking about here, was the energy. I have so much more energy. I feel like an entirely different person. And it just gives me a lot of hope for other people who can also have the same change if they get the right information. So first you went, first standard American diet, you had all these problems, and you went to more of a plant-based you know, diet, as you described it. So low sugar, low carb, was it just low carbs? Yeah, I was saying low sugar too. Yeah, low carb, low sugar, all that. It was just really a lot of high fat plant food and a lot of greens, right? So you could have all the celery you want, you could have lettuce, you know, stuff like that. And that helped you tremendously. But what, what made you go further and so, uh, you know, your current diet. Why was that not enough? Yeah. So this change from standard American diet to a plant-based ketogenic diet, definitely there were some benefits, but those benefits wore off quickly and I ended up losing a lot of weight, which was very frustrating. A freshman at the University of Florida at the time, I'm trying to play pickup basketball, I'm trying to be, you know, just enjoying college life and just literally having no energy, losing weight and just being a little bit lost. Then once I found out about this fruit-based approach, I, I heard a podcast. It's fun to say that on a podcast, but I heard a podcast with a guy named Doug Graham, and he was talking about how a fruit-based diet was just a powerhouse solution for a lot of different things. 
And he started to talk in the podcast about a book he had coming up. And so I ordered the book. This was, I heard this podcast in September of 2006. The book came out in December of 2006. And that's what changed my life. So the first week, I literally ate nothing but bananas, Richard. So this is around Christmas time. I come down to the family Christmas dinner and I literally have a pyramid peeled bananas on my plate. It's like four on the bottom layer, then three, then two, then one. It's a pyramid. And my grandmother was there. Family, thank you. Absolutely. They thought this was just another fad, you know? Like, they'd seen me go through so many different things, try so many crazy things, and go to all these natural grocery stores and buy all these weird products. And here we are now, 18 years later, and I'm still doing the same thing. So this one was not a fad. And I just kept on adding and adding. So the first week was just banana. Then I started adding greens. Then I started adding things like melons and papaya and berries and I learned how to follow a low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet focused primarily on fruit under the guidance of Dr. Doug Graham and that we had a daily interaction. And so I would email him every single day for 90 days straight. And I learned a lot. And it was that level of you know, coaching and support and accountability that really ended up getting me passionate about doing what we do at Master Diabetes because we provide coaching to help people adopt a really healthy, well-balanced, varied, low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet. All right. So quick, quick plug here. So the website is Mastering Diabetes or what is the- yeah, Yep. People go to Mastering Diabetes on our website. is a great place to start. And we're on all the social platforms at Mastering Diabetes. When you say Mastering Diabetes, so either type one or type two, you can help or do you focus on one or the other? So that's exactly right. Great question. The answer is all types. And so there's type one, there's type two, we covered those. There's also type 1.5, there's also gestational diabetes, and there's also prediabetes. And the thing that we do is we bring everybody together under one key premise, which is let's focus on a lifestyle that maximizes your insulin sensitivity. That is essential. That is key for all types of diabetes. And so prediabetes, in essentially 100% of cases, we can reverse prediabetes, no question. Type 2 diabetes depends on how long somebody has had the condition, right? So this is a very key distinction we made inside our book to really make a distinction between insulin-dependent type 2 diabetes and non-insulin dependent type 2 diabetes. And so what happens is, if you've been living with type 2 for an extended period of time, what's happened is over time, your pancreas gets exhausted. So the beta cells are the cells that produce insulin. They live inside your pancreas. And these cells are asked to produce more and more and more insulin as you continue to follow a lifestyle that keeps you insulin resistant. Insulin resistance is the cause of type 2 diabetes and prediabetes. And just to take a step back, the cause of insulin resistance is a diet high in fat. So the major culprits are trans fat, saturated fat, and then other fats coming from either even healthy plant-based sources in excess can be problematic. But we are all about addressing insulin resistance. And even if you have had type 2 diabetes for many years, it's possible that you could still completely reverse it based on the fact that you become super, super insulin sensitive. So if your pancreas is exhausted and you're producing just a small amount of insulin, as long as you can make that small amount work efficiently, then you can get off your medication. And this has got to be done under the care of a doctor because what happens is as you become more insulin sensitive, you can become over-medicated, right? So the danger is that you're having too many low blood glucose readings. That can be very problematic. And so we help people with type 2. Now, again, if prediabetes, 100%. There's no question. Somebody has prediabetes, that is the warning sign. That means you have not progressed to having your pancreas just completely exhausted. You're catching it early. And so that could be reversed, no question. And then type 2, we want to catch that as early as possible. And then type 1.5, that's also an autoimmune condition. So that's more like type 1. We don't know the cause of either one. We do know that they slowly progress 
and you got to be monitored and you got to get the right tests to make sure you're taking care of your health. Have you ever explored, you know, meat-based diets like carnivore or, you know, the regular ketogenic diet where it's, you know, high meat, high fat, low sugar, low carbs. You have any experience with those or what do you, what do you say out there for people that do those diets? So I personally have not done that diet or anything even close to it because my only ketogenic experience was with actually a plant-based version. So for me, the biggest concern with that program is the lack of fiber. I would say that's concern number one. We're living in a world where over 95% of the population in the United States does not consume the recommended daily amount of fiber. And that's problematic. And we are learning more and more about how fiber feeds our gut microbiome, how important our gut microbiome is for our overall health and including insulin sensitivity. So that would be my, you know, one big concern. But, you know, honestly, like, I think the people who are doing that diet, we have a lot more in common than we don't have in common, right? Like that person is willing to forego processed food. They're not having, you know, sugar-sweetened beverages. They are likely exercising. They're likely trying to get more sleep. They might be meditating, They are likely trying to get a lot of fresh air. Maybe they're trying to get their feet on the ground, do some grounding. Maybe they're involved with regenerative agriculture and not trying to support factory farming. Like there's a long list of healthy behaviors that come along with adopting that lifestyle. And I'm not like that interested in trying to tell people that's wrong, that's bad. He's all like, if that calling to somebody, then like go for it. But we're here for people who, don't they're struggling right now right they they, something is not working something is off they don't have the results they're looking for and to them a diet of plants sounds exciting like the ability to eat fruit like oh hey right now it's mango season in florida the seeing the mangoes on the trees and being able to go pick them and eat some fresh mangoes and eat some berries and have some bananas and some plantains. And at Master Diabetes, we have a whole green light category. So, so after fruits, then we have starchy vegetables like potatoes. And then we have legumes and we have intact whole grains. Like if somebody's in a place where they're just not happy with their health, like the results just aren't there and they want to eat those foods, then we are a great resource to help people adopt that lifestyle. What if someone says, I get it, I get it. I'll just do a plant-based diet. I know what to do. Like, wh- where do you see people going wrong, even if they try to approximate the diet without knowing the ins and outs of it? So I'm curious, Richard, have you tried a plant-based diet? No, I tend to like a lot of meat. I've done ketogenic, and that worked really well for me for a while, but just... Are you interested in a plant-based diet? I'm actually kind of a, I'm, I don't know. I'm kind of a, I guess, frankly afraid of it. But I just, again, I just want to feel well. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, you know, I just feel like I need meat in order to feel good. I understand the low sugar and I've done that for a while. And I know that is a huge help. It's reduced allergies. It's reduced weight. It's done all kinds of great stuff. The blue improved tons of biomarkers. But I guess I'm afraid to just do plants that I've been missing out on key ingredients. And again, I just won't feel well. And I'm, yeah. I think it's because I see a lot of vegans and stuff like that. I think they must be doing it wrong because they look awful, pasty, pudgy mushy, you know, pale, sickly looking. I, that's what I see a lot from people that tell me that they're vegan. So I'm like, something's not right here. You know? So I figure people are doing something wrong. That's why I asked. That yeah. I'm super glad we're having this conversation because I have a feeling a lot of the listeners are in the same boat. So let me first clarify the difference between the mastering diabetes method and a low fat plant-based whole food diet and you know, the type of diet that the people you just described are likely following. So this approach that we're talking about is completely different than a a vegan diet. We actually don't really, we don't use the word vegan in our book or in our approach. That's not what, this is about the science and it's about what people eat predominantly, right? We're not the food police. We're not militant about any specific nuance about like, does somebody have a little bit of animal products? That's up to each individual. It doesn't, not our thing to focus on. It's about your, your predominant diet. Okay. So The people who are pudgy, who are pasty, who don't look strong, don't have muscles, aren't athletic, they're likely eating a processed vegan diet, right? They're having impossible burgers. They're having tofurkey. They're having, you know, vegan donuts. Oreos are vegan, right? They're, They're eating a lot of processed food. They're not exercising. They're not focusing on their sleep. They're not focusing on meditation. They're just eating basically a standard American diet 
just with processed vegan food. So we wouldn't recommend that and that's not going to get great results. Now, back to your original point here, I'm curious for you to elaborate a little more. What do you think you'll be missing from on a, if you do a low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet? Well, I just feel like I won't be satiated from what I can see. So with meat, you want to avoid, you want to have grass-fed. You don't want to have the meat that's had antibiotics and hormones and stuff like that. But then with plant, you don't want to have pesticides. You don't want to have all that crap sprayed on them. So you certainly want, from what I can tell, organic, but I don't know how hard it is to get with plants. And again, then there's the fear of, uh, you know, again, I won't feel satiated. I'll kind of feel, I'll go through a period of X number of weeks, just feeling like crap and hopefully come out better on the other end. Like These are the things that are in my mind. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so I'm glad you brought up the topic of satiety because I think that is a general concern for a lot of people who are thinking about eating a more plant, predominant diet or a plant-centered diet is that, oh, wow, I'm just going to eat a bunch of salad. And that's a big, big misconception of what a truly healthy, low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet is. But we actually teach you know, adamantly against that because that would be a big problem. If all you did was have salads, you would not be satisfied. You wouldn't consume enough calories. And, and believe it or not, this is the number one mistake that people make when adopting a plant-based diet is that they don't consume enough of the calorie-dense plant foods. So a calorie-dense plant food would be something like, you know, bananas are far more calorie-dense than watermelon, all right? Potato is a heck of a lot more calorie-dense than having some lettuce, right? And satiety is water plus fiber. That's a huge component of satiety, right? This is water plus fiber equals bulk, and this happens when you consume whole plant foods, not processed plant foods. All right. We're not talking about juices here. We're not talking about processed like potato chips, right? Potato chips versus you taking potato and putting it in the oven. Two completely different experiences when it comes to satiety and your overall health. French fries too. Yeah. So French fries could be great. So you could basically take potatoes, slice them into strips and put them in an air fryer and you have French fries and you start putting on spices. You start dipping them in ketchup, mustard, like this diet can be really, really delicious. It can be simple. It can be fast. It's just that people need to really get the guidance into like how to proportion their plate to make sure they're satisfied. And it's also happening when you adopt a plant-based diet is you're learning how to actually eat more food. So literally people increase the total mass of food, the total volume by volume and by mass. Okay. And they lose weight, eat more, weigh less. That's a principle you'll hear all over the plant-based community. It is an absolute fact because when you're, when people see me eat a meal, like they can go on Instagram or something and watch me eat a meal in like real time. And it's like this gigantic bowl. They're like, that's ridiculous. How can you eat all that food? That volume is just crazy. Like that, that should be for like three or four people. And I always educate them. I said, look, it's deceiving. What you're seeing is actually a bunch of water. I'm consuming the most pure water you could possibly get your hands on, which is water that's been filtered by nature through the roots, through the plant, and is in the whole food. So for example, lettuce by mass is 95% water. The other 5% is the fiber and the nutrients. A banana is about 75% water. The rest is the fiber and the nutrients. We have the whole chart in our book about the, the water content of a bunch of plant foods. So it's not in front of me right now, but very, very high in water content. So I'm just consuming water through chewing my food and a bunch of fiber as well. So the satiety concern can be addressed very easily. And it just takes a little bit of nuance in the process of transitioning to learn how to eat larger volumes of food and have your hand, your stomach handle it. So that's why in our book, we have two different meal plans. Both meal plans have people change one meal at a time. You're going to be increasing the volume of fiber that's going into your stomach through this dietary approach. And it's best to do that slowly. Most people need to adjust. So you just change breakfast for a week and we have all the recipes in the book. Then you add in lunch. And maybe if you struggle a little bit with lunch, maybe then you do lunch for two weeks. Then you add in dinner and then you start changing your snacks. So it's a slow, steady change, but the calorie density is a key point for long-term success. And 
Also, I would say as far as like low energy and all that, that concern, yeah, there could be some level of, you know, detoxification of some sort and, and a headache here, a headache there. Or you just want to sleep a little more. Usually when you transition intelligently and slowly, it doesn't become overwhelming. It doesn't really have a dramatic impact on your life. And you start to see and feel the extra energy, usually in a matter of days. Oh, wow. But it seems like you're on more the fruit heavy part of the spectrum. And some people, I guess, do all plants and very little fruit. Like what are, what are some of the avatars within the diet plan you have that you see are successful? Yes. Okay. Great question. So there are any approach that was in the details and there's a lot of different nuances. Personally, I'm a huge fan. I just love fruit. And I, I just. Does your family say that you're like a fruit bat? For sure. Definitely heard all kinds of jokes like that. It's pretty funny. But I like the fruit. I also, I love greens and I love sprout, right? I mean, I love the fact that I can grow the sprouts at home, that they're fresh. So I don't want people to think I only eat fruit. Like I'm really, really into the greens and the vegetables. So bell peppers, that's technically a fruit. Botanically, it's a fruit, but it's, we consider it a vegetable. You know, uh, zucchini, cucumbers, carrots, beets, like all those foods are in my diet. And I love alfalfa sprouts, like a big thing. I just really like alfalfa sprouts. I put them in a roll, like a, a nori roll on a, almost a daily basis. And I find that they're also like, the fact that I can grow them on my own and also get them like pretty easily accessible at grocery stores these days is pretty cool. So, but- You just eat sprouts with nothing on them. They just go grab like a handful and eat it. I don't really, personally, I don't really do that. I do that with things like arugula. I think arugula's got a nice little kick and I, I do that, but- I like to mix it in with a salad. So when I have a salad, I like cutting the sprouts. So sometimes people think the sprouts, it has like this big fluffy volume and they're not really sure how to consume it, but I will kind of cut it up, then put it in the roll or I'll cut it up and put it in a salad. And my fruits are so ripe. Uh, the mango, the tomatoes, berries, papaya, fruits like that. They're so juicy that they actually form a dressing without even having to make one in the blender. Just cut up the fruit, put it in the salad, mix it up uh, with the greens and the sprouts, and it's just like a complete, complete package, and I uh, thoroughly enjoy it. So that's like the fruit one, right? Now, I would really say there's really just two main avatars. There's like, okay, yeah, people who love to eat tons and tons of fruit. Then there's a group that says, you know what? No, I like to have a balance of fruit and, and the starches. And that's what most people do. That's how the meal plan we've put together in the Mastering Diabetes book, which is including the starchy vegetables. That's potatoes. That would be yams. That's butternut squash, acorn squash, delicata squash. And then you had all the varieties of beans, right? So chickpeas, you know, pinto beans, red beans, black beans, so many different beans out there. Red lentils would be in this category as well. You know, there's all kinds of lentils, green lentils. Then we move into intact whole grains. So that's brown rice, that's wild rice, that's teff, that's millet. These are intact whole grains. Not We're not talking about rice cakes. Okay, this is where you go back to the whole calorie density concept where a whole like, brown rice is completely different than some sort of puffed rice cake. Completely different in the nutrition, completely different in how it's going to be metabolized and how that's going to impact your blood glucose levels, how it's going to impact the insulin you need to metabolize those foods. And that's why, again, our approach is so completely different than processed vegan diet. Then but you got those categories. Those are the starch. Those are like the, the calorie consuming categories. And then everything else, you know, pretty much everybody has. The non-starchy vegetables, the greens, herbs and spices and sprouts. That's pretty much all the different avatars are going to include those in some quantity. What kind of stories have you heard people that were really surprising to you or at least satisfying? So we have... An incredible amount of testimonials. We share about them obviously on our social media, on our website, on the webinars that we run. But to me, some of the best ones are the people who came in completely skeptical. So they're like, we're basically, once you get to a diet that's really as clean and simple as ours is, most people, they're kind of like at the end of their journey. Like they have tried so many different things. Like, okay, fine. I'll finally try this. Like, you know, people think our diet is, you know, really restrictive. We think it's actually expansive. It gives you freedom in your life. You're able to live the life you want. But Jason came to us. He was living with type 1 diabetes. And he had been doing a ketogenic diet for a long, long time. 
but he just wasn't happy. And the biggest problem that he had was that his cholesterol was super, super high. Like that was his big concern. He had gained weight and he's like, he literally showed up to our first small group coaching meeting and he says, just holding this apple makes me feel like my blood glucose is going to go up. Like I can feel my blood sugar going up just holding this thing. And he's a really funny guy. So again, I love the type one stories because the insulin sensitivity that we can see objectively through the insulin requirements is just profound. So he comes into our program and his ratio, I believe, was one to one. And it expanded all the way up to upwards of 30 to one for his total carbohydrate to insulin ratio. And that's profound. He lost a ton of weight. His cholesterol became under 150. That's where you want it. Under 150 with no medication, you're essentially heart attack. So he lost 19 pounds. His total insulin use went from 41 units per day to 33 units per day. Okay, so think about that. Total insulin use goes down. His carbohydrate intake went from 40 grams per day to 250 per day. That's profound. And that's insulin sensitivity. Now, Raj is another great story. Raj comes to us. He's living with type 2 diabetes. He is using metformin, which is the most common drug. It's like the first line of defense for type 2 diabetes. His A1C is 7.4%, all right? So you have to be below 5.7 to be non-diabetic. So once you hit 5.7 or above, you're either pre-diabetes or you're moving into type 2. His A1C is 7.4. His fasting blood glucose was 180 on medication. You really want people to understand that distinction. This is a medicated fasting blood glucose. This is a medicated A1C. It would be worse if he wasn't taking the 2,000 milligrams of metformin. He also oh, came yeah, to us. High. Yeah, super high. He came to us with fatty liver disease. He came to us with a total cholesterol of 215. And in a matter of six months, he drops his A1C to 5.2%. He doesn't use any more metformin anymore. His fasting blood glucose is 85 his fatty liver disease is completely reversed. His total cholesterol is 149 and he lost 64 pounds. Absolutely incredible turnaround. And he's no longer living with type 2 diabetes. He's no longer insulin resistant. He no longer has fatty liver disease. His heart disease risk is dropped dramatic and he has a completely different life. And now he can play with his kid. What does it take though for people that do this and fail versus succeed? What do they have to overcome? Like, you know, have you asked people, what is the hardest thing that they had to to do? Absolutely. Or was it just getting started? Well, I mean, in mastering diabetes, our, that's our whole our whole purpose is coaching people through the nuances. So well equipped to answer this question. The difference between those who succeed, you know, especially like out of the gate and then maintain it long term, are the people who have chosen to have accountability in their life and put systems in place to make it so their environment is conducive to the health that they're looking for. And there's a lot of adjustments that need to be made. And the biggest challenge people have is family and social situations. That's the biggest challenge. And if you can learn how to navigate that, how to communicate differently, how to plan appropriately for a wide range of circumstances, then you can master this. Because the results are so profound that everybody wants to continue. Nobody wants to go backwards. It's just a matter of being in that right environment and how to navigate the challenging environments. It's really the biggest challenge people have. What's the most difficult period of adjustment? Like the first week, first day, you know, what have you noticed is the most difficult time? I think people get really excited and they're very motivated for approximately three months. And then old habits start to creep back and they start to lose a little bit of their discipline. They got some results. They think, oh, you know, I, I can have this again now because I already lost this weight. I already, I already got, I already, you know, reverse type 2 diabetes. Maybe once he's good, like, I can have a little bit of a cheat here or a cheat there. It's a slippery slope and people are eventually back where they started. This happens all too often. But the people it does not happen to are the people who have accountability. They commit to a long-term program. They commit to a system. They have other supportive people in their life that are keeping them accountable to their goals. Another big difference is people who continuously set new goals, new goals that are meaningful, new goals that are worth pursuing. That is what keeps you going and you never have to stop for the rest of your life. You can always have new goals. There's always optimization. There's always new endeavors to pursue. There's, there's always, you know, again, improvements. So 
consistent goal setting is also important. So for people that want to engage with the program, what's the best way to start? Listen to the book or read the book first or go to the website? What- I would say best place to start is, I would agree with that, the book, right? So we read our own audio book, which is super fun. We have over 800 citations in that book. It's 100% evidence-based. We're not just sharing our personal experience and saying like, oh, just do what we did because it worked for us. Worked for us was rooted in science and that's why it works for you and tens of thousands of people that have been impacted by our work. So start there. You know, the book's also on Amazon, Google Play, the Kindle store and all that stuff. And then if you're ready to get started, if you're like, you know what, I'm ready. I want some accountability in my life. I want some coaching. I want to have this transition go as smooth as possible because I'm going to work with an expert who's been there, done that. Then you go to our website, masteringdiabetes.org, and you just click in the upper right, there'll be a button that says get started today. And you can talk to an enrollment specialist. That call doesn't cost you any money, but I would say don't book that call unless you're serious. You know, we don't, we don't really want need people wasting our time. Like that call is an opportunity to see what is going on. What is, who's the right coach for you? Do you need to be in private coaching? Do you need to be in small group coaching? Do you need to be in a weight loss group? Do you need to be with an insulin dependent group, a non insulin dependent group? There's a lot of different places that we can put you. And it's really about aligning you with the right program, the right coach, the right duration, the right interaction. So that's the purpose of those calls. And you can just easily book them on our website. Okay. No, that's, that's pretty simple. Absolutely. Last question. You know, I know you can't make promises and stuff like that, but you know, do people come to you with, you know, various illnesses uh, beyond diabetic complications? And has the program helped people that have other types of illnesses? Yes. And the main reason why people see such an improvement in other conditions is because there is a laundry list of conditions that are rooted in the insulin resistance, right? So the more insulin resistant you are, This means you have an increased risk of heart disease, cancer, chronic kidney disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, obesity, Alzheimer's disease, retinopathy, neuropathy, the list goes on, okay? So insulin resistance is sort of like what you consider a central node to those conditions. So conditions that are, we have ended up working with on a regular basis are high blood pressure, right? So that people could take care of in a matter of weeks, on a low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet. We have people have come to us with chronic kidney disease. We have seen stage three kidney disease be reversed. People have, we've definitely had some people with fatty liver disease. People come to us with obesity, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, all of these conditions we've taken care of. I mean, no question about it. Now, also we've had, you know, thinking of one specific client who was told he had to have six stents and he decided to change his lifestyle, and he avoided the stents. So heart disease is certainly impacted. Now, what we do is we, all along the way in all of our programs, we have people make sure they're working with a doctor. And if they don't have a doctor who's already supportive of what they're doing, then we send them to a partner program called Love Life Telehealth. It was formerly called Plant-Based Telehealth, and that's a a way to get a plant-based doctor through telemedicine. So you can have, they have covered in all 50 states, no matter where you live in the United States, you can talk to a qualified plant-based doctor. And if you live internationally, then you can also talk to a plant-based doctor. We just can't, you know, the doctors aren't able to adjust their medication. But yeah, like the whole point here is your body's a self-healing machine. Like your body, when given the proper nutrition, proper mindset, the body is a self-healing machine. It can heal from a lot of different conditions. And by focusing on becoming more insulin sensitive, you're setting yourself up for success. Very excellent. Well, Robbie, thank you again for coming back on the podcast. I appreciate it for the second time. Absolutely, man. It's great to be here with you. Keep up the great work. I'll catch you next time. Remember, before you go, check out cbdfx.com for the best in organic, all-natural CBD products, both for you and your pets. Boost your wellness today and get 25% off your first order. Plus, get a free CBD bath bomb when you use code GENIUS at checkout. That's code G-E-N-I-U-S. Don't miss this special 25% off offer for Finding Genius listeners only at CBDFX.com. Offer expires August 31st, 2023. Feel the difference with CBDFX. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. 
You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.